Assalamu alaikum and good evening to you all. Welcome to the sixth episode and the final episode of Masterclass for Medicine Final Part Examinee organized by SCP Bangladesh Chapter and supported by Bangladesh Society of Medicine. As you already know, it is a program which is designed for the Medicine Final Part Examinee as well as Midterm Preliminary Part 2 Examinees. Today is the last episode of our program and we have saved the best for the last. Today we will be learning about the management of hypertension. As you already know, every clinician must have the knowledge about this topic. To teach us about this topic, we have one of the best clinician of our country, Professor Muhammad Mujibur Rahman sir. He is the Professor of Medicine, BSSMU and Vice President of Bangladesh Society of Medicine. To chair the session, we have someone who is considered a true leader and a prodigy in the field of medicine. He is none other than Professor Khan Abul Kalam Ajat sir. He is the Governor-elect of SCP Bangladesh Chapter and former President of Bangladesh Society of Medicine. In the expert panel with us, we have two most renowned and prestigious professors of our country. Firstly, we have Professor Enamul Korim sir. He is the head and professor of medicine, Universal Medical College. Then we have Professor Major Retired MD Julhas Uddin sir. He is the head and professor of medicine, Marx Medical College. As a moderator, we have the talented Dr. Muhammad Mahfuzul Hoxar. He is the assistant professor of medicine, Dhaka Medical College. During the live session, you can ask topic related questions on the comment section. We shall try to answer them in the question and answer session, which will start right after the presentation. So, without doing any further delay, let me hand off the session to Dr. Muhammad Mahfuzul Hoxar. Dr. Muhammad Mahfuzul Hoxar. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Uh, Prince Kausar. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and a good evening to all. This is a, uh, a, a program uh, which has been uh, um, routinely organized by the uh, American College of Physicians and supported by Bangladesh. Very delighted uh, uh, to be part of this uh, program. And uh, at the first, uh, I want to give thanks to uh, uh, our, our very respected Professor Kanabul Kalam Azad, sir, uh, Governor SCP, and uh, who, will the chair, uh, who will chair this session today. Uh, uh, and we, I would like to uh, also mention that uh, today's topic, that is management of hypertension, is going to uh, presented by Professor Muzibur Rahman Saad. Uh, and there is nothing to uh, say about the Professor Muzibur Rahman Saad, uh, particularly in this, uh, in this topic of hypertension. Once uh, our Professor Muzibur Rahman Saad told that if someone asked him to become a which kind of specialist he want to be uh, in his uh, uh, postgraduate uh, training, he told that uh, I want to be a, uh, a specialist of hypertension. So uh, it, it's assuming that how much interest Professor Muzibur Rahman sir has in the hypertension. And he has several uh, papers uh, on the uh, hypertension. And we are also delighted that uh, we have two panel of experts, uh, Professor uh, Mohammad Julhas Uddin sir, and Professor Enamul Karim sir, uh, who uh, both of uh, uh, them are very much talented and they are very much learned. And we think, uh, I think this uh, program will be very interesting. And uh, uh, the program which is intended for the student will learn many things. And as we know, the hypertension is the one of the clinical condition. Uh, it is estimated that it is about uh, one, uh, more than one and a half billion of people is uh, suffering from hypertension worldwide. 
and uh, about 1 billion of them in the uh, low and middle income country. And not only that, uh, the, not only the prevalence of hypertension and the clinical importance, it is also important in the exam settings. It is asked in the, uh, uh, particularly in the interactive oral session, which has been recently introduced in the exam setting of the Bangladesh physician DCPS. Uh, 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 and there are uh, in various types of settings in the exam, it, uh, it is usually asked or it, it is said. So the management of hypertension, though it is very common, and uh, but it is sometimes maybe a, a important topic which can uh, lead to a student uh, a, a bad outcome. So everybody, everybody of us uh, should know the hypertension. So uh, before uh, uh, starting the, uh, going to the Professor Muzibur Rahman sir, I want to go to the Professor Khan Abul Kalamaza sir to start the, uh, uh, the uh, program. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mahfuz, for your excellent uh, words uh, regarding such a uh, um, scientific presentation. Uh, American College of Physicians, uh, the way uh, it, it is uh, progressing and also taking the charge to help the students and also incorporating our great scholar teachers in this context is a wonderful uh, happening. And I like to say that. Uh, uh, our honorable governor, uh, he is uh, always a philosopher, a great thinker, and definitely the important aspects of uh, clinical medicine are uh, always uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, important for the uh, for a trainee doctor for the future and also for the examination. And uh, truly speaking, uh, before going to uh, the uh, meeting, I will definitely uh, put some remarks later. But Professor Mujibur Rahman is such a, a scholar. I don't need to uh, introduce him, but he is a very, very great collaborator of medicine. He is such a wonderful person whose uh, brain always works with your students' welfare. And our two great teachers, a uh, very two very great souls of the soil, Professor Namul Karim and Professor Zulhas. They are very kind-hearted people and also great teachers. Long time experience. They are here. So also our new scholar going to be Dr. Mahfuz, and also young, uh, you know, our uh, uh, anchor Dr. Prince, and also for whom the uh, meeting is there. Uh, all the you know participants uh, because all the participants when they participate a meeting becomes successful so uh, professor mujib will be successful our experts will be successful i will be successful acp will be successful if our participants understand the uh, the topic the lecture and also we invite many questions from the student thank you very much without delay i like to request professor mohammad mujib rahman to begin his excellent speech, what I would say. Thank you very much, Professor Mujib. Please go on. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the SCP uh, Bangladesh chapters governor elect, Professor Khan Abul Karamajad, and also two other eminent professors, uh, Professor uh, Enamul Karim and Professor Jul Hashuddin. Both of the, all of these three is my guru, is my uh, elder brother, is my uh, are my teachers. Uh, I have learned so many things from them, in, from the very uh, studenthood of my life in the medical colleges. Uh, but in front of them, I always remain very uh, submissive. I don't know whether I will be able to present. Uh, the, 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 the topic like uh, hypertension in front of them, but I will try my best. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahfuz, the moderator of this session. Thank you very much. So management of hypertension, management. In our student life, we owe this management of hypertension to our great teacher, Professor S. G. M. Chaudhuri. 
uh, everybody here except Mahfuz, uh, uh, me, Professor uh, Khan Abul Kalam Azad, Professor Enamul Karim, and Professor Zulhar Shuddin, and also the uh, uh, governor of this, uh, uh, the, the present governor ACP Bangladesh chapter, Professor H. A. M. Nazmul Hassan, all are the students uh, of Professor H. G. M. Choudhury. We are very much thankful to him. May Allah uh, place his soul in the Jannah. Uh, anything, if we can learn, if we have learned anything in medicine that goes to him, and we all are owed to him for the clinical medicine and also teaching of hypertension. Hypertension itself is a specialty that has been told by Professor S. G. M. Choudhury in our undergraduate lectures. And I have seen him uh, coming to the lectures with a very small uh, handout, hand notes, and that was taken from the, the then JNC, Joint National Committee. He started, we got from JNC 3, 4, 5, etc. from him. So now I am going to my, my, my topic now. The management of hypertension is, is uh, we, we have to understand about the burden of hypertension first. Burden, hypertension is a great burden throughout the world and also in our country. If we see the world burden that it, this hypertension affects more than 30% of the adult population worldwide, more than 30%. If you consider 18 years and above, then, then it comes to more than 1 billion people around the world has been suffering from hypertension. It is the main risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. What are those? The cardiovascular diseases, uh, the uh, coronary heart disease, stroke. Stroke is a cardiovascular disease. Nowadays, the nomenclature has been changed. Cardiovascular is not only the blood vessel disease and also is not only the cardiac diseases. CKD is also one of the important cardiovascular disease. Heart failure is a cardiovascular disease. Arrhythmia is among them and also dementia. This chronic dementia, chronic hypertension will lead to the development of loss of brain function and ultimately will be leading to dementia. So these are the important cardiovascular uh, diseases that will be coming from the effect of hypertension. So hypertension is very important. If we see in our country, uh, the, again, this is global prevalence, the uh, global uh, burden of diseases in 2012 is, is around eight years old. They have been told that the 29% will be by 2025, 20, but you have seen that in the previous slide that uh, it has been already 30 percent worldwide so next slide please in bangladesh the uh, burden again uh, next slide yes next slide in bangladesh we have two studies done in bangladesh one in 2010 another is 2018 in 2010 the prevalence was around 20%. On the other hand, in 2018, it is around 21%. So in these eight years of time, there is not much increase in the total prevalence of hypertension. But there is some, some, some uh, changes among the male-female distribution of the hypertension, you can see here. Uh, so these are the more... Uh, more most important publications from Bangladesh perspective. Next one, please. Uh, due to some technical difficulties, I am not able to share my slides. So I am asking Dr. Prince to share on favor on, on, on in favor of me, and that is why I have to say every time. Next time, please. Okay, thank you, Prince. Uh, this is the slide from our study, it has been shown that as the age is going up, the prevalence of hypertension is also being going up. You see, in the age group 65 and above, the rate of prevalence is 41%. 
On the other hand, 25 and uh, 34, this 10 years group is only 6.8%. So as the age increasing, the pre prevalence is gradually increasing. So this uh, uh, next one, please. Uh, in this slide, I want to say about the definition of hypertension. Uh, with this definition, there are some much confusion and and uh, 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 there is uh, again very much disagreement between the between the between the scientists about the definition. But still, we will be taking this as the definition of hypertension as blood pressure is more than or equal to 140 by 90 should be considered as hypertension. But you see, a patient has come to you and you have measured the blood pressure. Blood pressure is 150 by 92. But this single measurement, by this single measurement, you cannot take the, that individual as hypertensive. So uh, there must have been at least three measurements, at least one week or more apart. If that individual fulfills this definition, this cutoff value, then that individual will be taken as, will be labeled as hypertensive individual. So single blood pressure recording cannot label an individual as hypertensive. This is very important. Next one. Uh, two terms we are used to uh, habituated during the definition of hypertension. One is white coat hypertension, another is masked hypertension. What is white coat hypertension? It, uh, I think you all know the what is white coat hypertension. The white coat of the doctor or the appearance of the doctor in front of the patient will increase the sympathetic overactivity and lead to the uh, transient rise of blood pressure. Every time the patient comes in front of a doctor or a, an individual with white coat, that individual will be having a, a bit of higher blood pressure level. This is what is called uh, white coat hypertension. And how to eliminate this white coat effect, I will be describing a bit later. Masked hypertension. What is masked? It, it, this might be a new terminology to some of you. Masked. That is the hypertension, the blood pressure becomes low whenever the individual comes in front of a doctor. This is a very rare phenomena. White coat is a very common phenomena. On the other hand, the mask hypertension is a very rare phenomenon. So, uh, but it can happen still. You have to remember. And that is why you always need to do measuring blood pressure at the home. Uh, Prince, next one, please. Uh, blood pressure classification. The blood pressure classification, again, uh, this is a very uh, inconvenience whenever I discuss this classification of blood pressure because there are much confusion among the scientists, among the hypertension specialists throughout the world. But JNC7 that has been published in JAMA in 2003, that was a very elaborative classification criteria and also guideline for management of hypertension. And this classification, you see, normal is less than 120 by 80. Pre-hypertension is between 120 to 139 systole and 80 to 89 diastole. So this is pre-hypertension and subsequently, this definition of prehypertension has been obsolete by the American uh, uh, authority. And the stage one hypertension, stage two hypertension. You see, in JNC6, JNC5, there are stage three hypertension also. But in JNC7, they have been described that the, the, the leveling of stage three or four or more is 
is is not needed because the implications of stage this stage one from starting from 160 systolic or diastolic starting from 100 is same if you consider the implication of blood pressure above 180 degree 180 uh, millimeter not, not degree 180 millimeter of mercury so they have been merged these two stages because the management and the implications and the prognosis all are same so only stage two is enough to designate more than 160 or more than 100 millimeter of mercury and that is why it is being used in further one thing i want want to mention is that jnc you know jnc is joint national committee joint national committee is a body that has been proposed by national heart uh, lung and blood institute of nih nih is a is an authority institute of united states and and it has several institutes and several authorities national heart lung blood authority is one of them this national heart blood lung institute has been proposed jnc8 uh, after being published this one in 2003 but by the end of 2013 they are not able to propose the guideline for management of hypertension this long 10 more than 10 years of time but there are some reasons there are some uh, 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 disagreement between the authorities and that is why it was very difficult to put forward with the uniform recommendation and subsequently that national heart lung and blood institute they withdrawn the mandate from the jnc8 to put forward the guideline and subsequently the total authoritative uh, commitment was given to american uh, uh, American College of Cardiology and American Hypertension, uh, AHA, American Hypertension Association. The, uh, these two institutes, two organizations has been given the authority of put forwarding the guidelines for hypertension. But at that time, very rapidly, uh, those committees, JNC8, they published a hurried guideline in JAMA 2014 or 13 probably I, uh, but i don't use that jnc8 because uh, their uh, formation was subsequently taken by the authority so uh, uh, that jnc proposes proposed that uh, jnc8 guideline and that was a very troublesome and very uh, difficult uh, guideline but subsequently uh, the uh, next one, please, Prince. Uh, this guideline was proposed by, this classification was proposed by uh, ACC and AHA in American uh, uh, Heart Association in 2017. Uh, this, they have been put forward normal as, as before, uh, less than 120 by 8. Elevated is 120 to 129 and less than 80, it's elevated. And hypertension, more than 130 is hypertension. So the definition of hypertension has been changed here. You see, uh, they are telling that though this is a based uh, late of the guideline, so if you can remember this one, it's fine. So here is no term which is called pre-hypertension and stage 2 is more than 140. So uh, you see this uh, proposition of guideline or classification of blood pressure was made due to publication of an important article which is known as print. I know everybody of internal medicine training must know this is print. Sprint was a trial. I will be just uh, saying something on Sprint. Is tight control of blood pressure less than 120 by 180, 
and another group was less than 140 by 80, the 90, the conventional definition. So they shown that there was a tremendous amount of benefit whenever there is blood pressure target is less than 120 by 80. So that is why the total definition has been changed depending on that sprint article, sprint trial. So if you can remember this one, fine, because for the student, if you use any of this classification, I mean, I don't do classification that might confuse you more. But I would suggest you that you remember one. Anything you say from these uh, definitions, everything will be accepted by your teacher, by us. Uh, next one, please. Uh, this is the classification. Uh, you see, every time anything on the both parts of the Atlantic Ocean, there is a great division. Uh, the eastern part of the Atlantic Ocean, they think in such a way that the western part of the Atlantic, they thought in a different way. That is why there is some sorts of disagreement between this classification criteria. So, my dear trainees and students, if you use anyone, this is has been written in your Davidson's, is why, well, no problem. You can, you, you, you can tell this one also. So, next one, please. Uh, this is the NICE guideline, British guideline. This is also in conformity with the European diagnostic, uh, European classification. Next one, please. How to measure blood pressure? Blood pressure measurement, there are several types of measurement of blood pressure. One is called office measurement, home measurement, and ambulatory BP measurements. Uh, next one, please. You see this. Uh, this is, you know, the measurement of blood pressure is very important. is a paramount of a, a paramount importance. Uh, that is why this year WHO slogan is measure your blood pressure accurately, control it, and live longer. Because the management of blood pressure is very much dependent on the measurement of blood pressure. There are so many things. Only measurement of blood pressure might need one lecture class. If you ask Professor Khanna Kalamajat, if you ask Professor Enamul Karim or Professor Julhash, they will take one class only for the measurement of blood pressure. But I am not going into the details. Is you must have to be very cautious. There are different types of manometer. This is uh, this has been shown is the. Uh, 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 electronic device, not all electronic devices are the very good device. The Omron, we usually accept Omron is a very good device. Ami company pocketable of a And how to how to choose the size of the calf is very important. It's a very big fatty individual, very slim calf. It's not. It should at least encircle two thirds of the uh, uh, arm circumference and it should be very well placed over the arm and there should have around one inch place uh, uh, between the calf and the cubital fossa, the midline of the cubital fossa. So, to place this stethoscope, please don't push this stethoscope behind the calf. It's a very miss uh, uh, placement of the uh, of the uh, uh, the 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 bell of this uh, the the diaphragm of the stethoscope behind the calf again if you deflate the abhi khub shankhebe bole jacchi during deflection don't uh, deflate the calf like shesh hoye gelo doctor sahab er blood pressure maple erokomi hoy shesh kore namai dilo shesh no 2 mm per second it would be 2 mm per second and that is why Inter observer variation is a great. Ami blood pressure measurement, Amar interni de de Kielsi, Amar blood pressure measurement, Ami Amar training de de Kielsi, even inter observer variation is a great variation. During the, uh, if we see the blood pressure reading, 
it's 175 by uh, uh, 95. It means that you did not look blood pressure very carefully because in our aneroid manometer, there is nothing say 95, there is nothing 75. It would be in the range of two digits. So it would be 96 or 94. Tarmane apni avarez korachan. So this 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 avoidance of this uh, uh, the averaging of the figure of blood pressure, but sometimes it can happen with these sorts of manometer like electronic device. Yes, it can happen. Uh, next one is home blood pressure measurement. Home blood pressure measurement. Once upon a time, we did not, our professors did not allow the patient to measure blood pressure at home. But nowadays, nowadays, to eliminate the effect of uh, mast hypertension, to eliminate the effect of white coat hypertension, we should also measure high blood, uh, measure blood pressure at home. So we have to choose which patient should be selected in these particular cases. And another measurement technique is ambulatory blood pressure measurement. Amra shadaran tete puri na onik dami machine. Ita amader private practice ba hospital practice. Amra usually use kori na only research purpose ya hoto kono kono jaga ita used hote pare. So there is some corresponding values. Apnara je office ba clinic blood pressure. That clinic blood pressure corresponds to home blood pressure measurements like this. If we go below, if it is 120 by 80, the home blood pressure is the same. The daytime ambulatory blood pressure measurement is the same. The nighttime blood pressure measurement will be a bit lower, on a lower hobby in the nighttime. But average 24 hours is five less than the clinic blood pressure measurement. You see, if it is 130 by 80, if the clinic blood pressure going up, the difference is also going up. Next one, please. Uh, what Amra blood pressure usually we classify blood pressure like this the primary or essential hypertension. The term essential hypertension is now obsolete because essential means it can happen with us, it can exist with us. No, it, it, it can be a comparable disease with malignancy if remains untreated. So hypertension, uh, it's a primary hypertension or it can be secondary hypertension. So we will not use the term essential hypertension. Understand? So secondary hypertension, whenever the hypertension comes, it means the primary hypertension. In our settings, it usually less than 90 to 95 percent of the total population of uh, less than uh, 5 to 10 percent of the total population of hypertensive individuals are secondary hypertension. So in my whole discussion, I will not say anything about secondary hypertension. But now what are the secondary causes of hypertension and how will you uh, find a clue to the presence of secondary hypertension. I will just mention two things here. The important cause is kidney. There are several kidney diseases that is linked to a secondary hypertension. You all know, I'm not going into the details. Pregnancy, the endocrine diseases, some uh, like uh, thyroid toxicosis, like uh, the few chromocytoma, like uh, uh, Cushing's, and uh, uh, these are the some of the uh, endocrine causes and other causes the congenital is coarctation of the aorta so these are the secondary causes i'm not going when you will suspect a patient having been with secondary hypertension there are some important clues important problems a young individual has come to you in his 30 with sudden rise of high blood pressure, with excessive sweating and flushing of face. And again, after having been sedated, the patient, the, the condition is reversed 
And so this sort of paroxysmal rising of blood pressure leads to the suspicion of few chromocytoma. Or a, an individual in his 30 having been uh, very high rise of blood pressure in stage 2, Jodi Ami American Yeteboli, or stage 3 in European standard of definition, and not responding to usual treatment, and not responding to usual combination of drugs, then think of the presence of secondary hypertension. And this much about secondary hypertension. Next, the uh, risk factors for essential hypertension. Why do we develop hypertension? The risk factor. You see, if we consider the non-communicable diseases, there are some sorts of risk factors. Risk factors in the community, risk factors in the middle, and the target diseases. So hypertension basically is not a disease. It's a risk factor for, for the development of other common cardiovascular diseases or the NCDs, common and non-communicable diseases. And hypertension is an intermediate risk factor. And hypertension, again, is coming from age, or that is elderly, obesity, family history, race and ethnicity, high sodium diet, physical inactivity, excessive alcohol consumptions, and reduced numbers of nephrons in the adults. Reduced number of nephrons. There is, this is very tricky <coughs> term number of nephrons because wh whether this reduced number of nephrons is giving rise to hypertension or hypertension is leading to this reduced number of hypertension is a tricky question which one is first the hen first or the egg first i am not going into those debate uh, and next one please hypertension uh, our patient usually tells us that Dr. Shahid, our blood pressure is by no body up or down. Our blood pressure is going to be high. Our blood pressure is going to be high. Our blood pressure is going to be high. Our as he described that, that his head and neck is the manometer for, manometer for blood pressure measurement. So these are the psychological issues you have to keep in mind. Usually blood pressure is asymptomatic. But rarely it can cause some of the symptoms. Those are headache, neck ache, dizziness, and vertigo, blurring of vision. So these are some of the important uh, clinical features. Those can happen in very high rise of blood pressure. And sometimes these symptoms may happen without being rise in blood pressure in too much decrease. So you have to judge the patient very carefully. But in most of the situations, blood pressure is asymptomatic. That is why it is being labeled as silent killer. You see, a rickshaw puller or a day laborer working in the village or in the street, but he doesn't have any symptom. Once upon a time, he came to the hospital in the emergency department of in an, any hospital. He was found to be unconscious. And on measurement of blood pressure, it was more than 200 systolic. And diastolic blood pressure is 130. And the patient's family members, they all were unaware of, about the presence of hypertension previously. That is why it is called silent killer. Next one, please. Uh, complications of hypertension. These are very common thing. I think you all know all these things, starting from the brain to the top to the uh, toes. Every organ can be affected. Every vital organs can be affected by hypertension. Next one, please. Why should we treat hypertension? As I have told that, it has got no symptoms. So why should we treat hypertension? The more, more, not to reduce only the blood pressure, 
we have to reduce we have to reduce the mortality we have to reduce the cardiovascular and other target organ damage of by the hypertension that is why we have to treat the hypertension next one please next one yes from observational data it ami bodin jabot ei slide ta dekhai because i love this slide uh, you see the blood pressure rise of blood pressure increases the cardiovascular diseases the observational data shows that the observational studies those were done in 50s those were done in 60s only observational data showing that the cardiovascular uh, diseases are increasing and subsequently if we treat the hypertension the cardiovascular diseases is reducing so this is very important that is why we have to treat the hypertension next one please you see here in this slide uh, the men and women the uh, this is the hypertensive individual this is normotensive individual the coronary heart disease is increased substantially among the hypertensives you see this was the study published first in 1961 1961 this is observational data the framingham framingham observational study they done in it, they done they started doing it from 40s 50s and published in 61 on the other hand it was published in 1970 that the veterans administration study this is a cohort among this cohort the treatment was showing tremendous benefit among the hypertensive individuals you see active treatment there is far far less number of this cumulative incidence of end <coughs> points next one please Uh, uh i don't want to say anything about this slide uh, this slide shows that only if any degree of hyper uh, reduction of blood pressure can give benefit so benefit occurs from reduction of blood pressure eta amader obosshoi mone rakhte hobe next slide please uh these are the uh, benefit showing benefit active treatment better Active, uh, active treatment worse. So uh, this is a blobogram by forest plot showing active treatment is better. All the all the studies, few of them I will be discussing later on. Next one, please. Amar kase control thakle ami khub dhu to cholo jete baptam. To eglu ami khub beshi dakhate chai na. Next one cholo jao. Yes. Which blood pressure is important? Which blood pressure? Is it the systolic or diastolic blood pressure? Actually, I am not just a doctor. I am. I am the sarra. I am senior trainee. I am. Then only the diastolic blood pressure was given importance. Only diastolic and systolic blood pressure was not given any importance. Next one, please. if we see some of the studies this was pub, this was published in 1992 mr fit trial it shows that if diastolic blood pressure goes up and if the systolic blood pressure goes up the cumulative incidence of multiple uh, uh, incidence of those death rates of coronary heart disease and death were very was very high with increasing both the systolic and diastolic blood pressure so from the very beginning of the 90s the studies showed that both systolic and diastolic blood pressure are important next one with few trials the isolated systolic and diastolic blood pressure if we consider only isolated diastolic blood pressure in that patient the systolic blood pressure is normal less than 140 if diastolic blood pressure is less than uh, more than 90 that is called isolated diastolic pressure you see the isolated diastolic blood pressure has got no impact with isolated and no isolated diastolic blood pressure the implication is same implication is so 
systolic blood pressure has got some more importance than the diastolic. But once a patient has got systolic blood pressure raised, then the raising of diastolic blood pressure is also important. Next one, please. This is a very recent study. That, that study was published in 2020. And this is a NEZM study published in uh, 2019. You see the percentage of participants with composite outcome. The composite outcome more with systolic blood pressure and also with diastolic blood pressure. But the significance of this is, a, is lower than the systolic blood pressure. But this is also important. Next one, please. Hypertension leads to, I mean, again, hypertension leads to target organ damage. Okay, go on. Next one. Target organ damage. I mean, again, I mean, I mean, Next one. So, landmark trials. These are the landmark trials in hypertension. Our training there, a landmark trials group is one of the I mean, 2017, 18 a examination is shown by FCPS exam is shown by a foreigner amar co examiner chilean so he was planning to ask about sprint because sprint was published and much much uh, uh, debates and the uh, uh, was doing with these uh, sprint trial publications so the uh, co-examiner of me was planning to ask, he was asking, if I ask sprint, are your students can uh, tell anything about the sprint? Our students definitely know the findings of the sprint, but the term sprint, S-P-R-I-N-T, may not be, may not be known to him because this acronym, all these trials are known by some of the acronym. You must know, you must remember this acronym. I don't think all can be remembered by someone, but some of the important acronyms should be, should be because these are the evidences that, that lead you to choose the antihypertensive drugs, that lead you to choose the, uh, the, the, the scenario in which which antihypertensive drug you will be choosing. So next one, please. Now, how to evaluate during treatment? This is this ETAP evaluation. Our trainees must know one thing that any problem you may ask, you may ask by your examiner that how will you evaluate this problem? How will you evaluate this patient? So any evaluation comes with history, physical examination, and lab tests. This is mandatory for any problem. So why should we evaluate? We should evaluate the patient for the presence of any other cardiovascular risk factors or whether the patient has developed any target organ disease or any complications of hypertension. That is why you have to assess the patient, you have to evaluate the patient. Clear. I mean, I cannot details. Kisu bolte chachi na. History the onik points as a glu bolte gale onik shomai lege jabe. But the main thing is to assess two things: risk factors, other cardiovascular risk factors, because. The hypertension is a cardiovascular risk factor. So a hypertension is kunu ko or karasikina dara ekotre derails kore dita pare. So for this reason, you have to go through history, physical exam, and labs. I am not going into the details. Next. Uh, CVD risk. The multiple risk factors you see. If one individual has got one risk factor, the risk of developing cardiovascular morbidity, mortality will be lesser. Then if one patient has got three or more cardiovascular risk factor, so you have to assess 
multiple risk factors next one please नेक्स्ट वन भारक्रांत करते चाहिए Uh, this chart is very important it was published in 1991 in circulation you see the cholesterol cholesterol the total cholesterol the high uh, high density lipoprotein lower kototuku lower that is important the smoking diabetes and lvh if one patient has got the blood pressure hypertension <clears throat> hypertension is Uh, 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 hypertension and also this all the risk factors with it then then the incidence of this 10 year risk of coronary heart disease will be so many times higher than if it is in this level or that no no all, all are no then you, <coughs> you can imagine the how much important the presence of other risk factors so you have to assess for this reason also this is proved by evidences next one please other risk factors are very important yes next one goals of therapy again there is much confusion around the goal of therapy the main public health goal is to reduce the cardiovascular and renal mortality and morbidity this is in short but when you can achieve this public health goal then you have to reach a value of blood pressure what is that next please uh, the confusion with this the the recommendation done in 2017 the the goal is le- 2017 is a very tighter goal but before that the goal was 140 by 90 less than 140 by 90 if the patient has got diabetes or renal disease it is a bit tighter less than 130 by 80 but the guideline and the uh, presented in 2017 that is also very tighter and they did not stratify this hypertension with diabetes and renal disease they have been put forward less than 120 by 80 is the target those who can tolerate kotha ta kintu khub sundor jara tolerate korte pare tader jonno less than 120 by 80 korte hobe tolerate mane hocche if you uh, 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 try to tight the control try to tight the uh, lower the level very tightly then those some of the patients those who are elderly might have some symptoms like dizzy uh, fall so 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 in those situations you have to closely observe the patient and in those cases only it would be less than 140 by 90 but in jnc 8 the so called jnc8 they have uh, the goal was a very broader goal and that was been criticized widely ebong tader emon criticize korche internationally share bolar moto na to jao kotha ami jacchi na odike next one please so goal is less than 120 by 80 next one please eta kichu bolte chai na ami next one please strategies of treatment what are the strategies there are two ways of uh, strategy to treat hypertension one is lifestyle changes that is being called non pharmacological measurement non pharmacological treatment and another one is pharmacological treatment next one please the lifestyle modification the term lifestyle modification is one generic term for non pharmacological treatment uh the weight reduction the dash diet adoption the dietary sodium reduction physical activity i am not going into the details 
all modalities will have the impact of reducing blood pressure to some degrees. It has been proved by evidences. Next one, please. No, it has dashed down. Yes, these are the development. You see, after 2001, there. I want to say in 1990s er pore ashole effective kono anti hypertensive treatment ashole asheni but after that there are some strategies has been developed the strategies the combination the control those has been put forward after that but the main classes of drugs has been developed within 1990s next one please আমি এখন এখান থেকে দুই একটা স্টাডির কথা একটু যা সংক্ষেপে বলবো এগুলো বললে অবশ্য খুব ক্লামজি হয়ে যাবে আমার মনে হয় বেশি বেশি হয়ে যাচ্ছে দি শেপ স্টাডি ইট ওয়াজ পাবলিশড ইন নাইনটিন এটা ক্লোরথ্যালিডন এবং অ্যাটেনল দিয়ে দেখা যাচ্ছিল যে ব্লাড প্রেশার রিডিউস করে এবং রিডিউস স্ট্রোক বাই থার্টি and that is why at that time beta blocker and chlorothalidone was the choice of drug at that time beta blocker subsequently beta blocker went out from the scenario by some of the studies next one please uh, this is another the the cyst euro or the systolic hypertension in the europe uh, this also uh, one of the calcium channel blocker with hydrochlorothiazide combination that was very much effective in reducing the cardiovascular mor morbidity and mortality p value were highly significant it was published in lancet 1997 next one please so i just want to show this that all the drugs are effective if you can reduce the level of blood pressure then you will get benefit some benefit with some drug some more benefit with some some other drugs the escort the anglo scandinavian cardiac outcomes trial in these the calcium channel blocker and scei combination was tremendously beneficial over beta blocker and diuretics is extremely beneficial you see the p value were highly significant next one please the high weight trial the very elderly individuals the treatment the treatment of hypertension is very important treatment diuretic plus perindopril with matching placebo the importance of treatment is highly the heart failure reduced by uh, but the other benefits only uh, all cause mortality reduced by 21% and death from stroke reduced by 39%. These are significant. But stroke reduced by 30%, the p-value somehow or other, it was not significant. Next one, please. Yes. This is progress study, perendopril study. Again, perendopril showing tremendous benefit in secondary prevention of stroke. Secondary prevention. Already stroke, jadirase, recurrent stroke prevention eh? this progress study showed perindopril that is the 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 SEI is tremendously beneficial next on target trial this is a huge trial this on target trial compares the tell me certain with uh, remipril and also combination of tell me certain plus remipril so this study gave us the idea that the, the combination of telmisartan and remipril, that is in other words, ARB plus SEI is harmful, is detrimental to kidney disease and is not beneficial overall. That is the Kaplan mayor showing there is no separation of the, of the card. So combination is not needed or you can use ARB or the SEI with equal benefit. Which one is more beneficial? So this bigger trial showed no one is more beneficial than the other one. Next one, please. 
This is the again on target. Next one. The prophecy trial. Tell me certain with placebo. Tell me certain is highly effective in preventing stroke. Second stroke. Second stroke. That is the secondary prevention of stroke. Another like like another study that I already told. Next one, please. Uh, this study was published in uh, the, the, the again the same study, the major events, and another important the new onset of diabetes, the new onset of diabetes with treatment with other drugs and placebo and treatment with other drugs plus tell me certain the tell me certain prevents new onset of diabetes mellitus you see it may be a class effect next one please a roadmap trial i am not going into the details uh, the the on the microalbuminuria or miss certain next one please the sprint trial this is the last trial i want to mention in front of you sprint you see the cumulative hazard. Uh, this is this is this is what is called Kaplan Mayer chart, showing the separation of the chart widely after some years of time, and that separation is tremendously beneficial. The intensive treatment group and the standard treatment group. Intensive treatment group is less than 120 by 80, and the standard treatment group is less than 140 by 90 you see the cumulative hazard again the cumulative hazard in in is, is is tremendously beneficial this is primary outcome and this is death from any cause the primary outcome was composite endpoint of kotogula chilo tarmode stroke chilo mi chilo primary outcome details ni ashine ekhane and death from all cause is again death is also much reduced with this intensive treatment group and that is why they put forward the definition of hypertension a bit lower and they are trying to control blood pressure more tightly next one please drugs available you all know all these drugs are available the diuretics the the thiazide loops and the potassium sparing diuretics next one please the other drugs are the beta SEI, SEI, you know, SEI and ARBs, SEI and ARBs. Next one, please. Uh, the calcium channel blockers. There are two types of calcium channel blockers, non-dihydropyridines. These non-dihydropyridines are less antihypertensive and the dihydropyridine groups are potent antihypertensive group. The other drugs are alpha blocker, the central acting drugs. These are not used very commonly. Once upon a time, this chronidine, methyl dopamine, these are been, where the drugs those used. And this uh, hydrilazine, hydrilazine is a drug that can be used in hypertensive emergency situation. Next one, please. Choice of antihypertensive drugs. The choice, it depends on the degree of blood pressure elevation, target organ damage, clinical cardiovascular disease, or other risk factors, socioeconomic condition of the patient, especially the financial status, possibly of interaction with other drugs, and variation in individual patient response. And this is the, this is the, uh, uh, no, no, uh, the initial therapy is SCI or ARB plus calcium channel blocker, J contractor Shangeta or diuretic. Jeta Hoy, J Bola Hoy, any elderly patient, elderly than 50, should be started with calcium channel blocker, or age less than 50, should be started with uh, SCI or ARB. If the patient is not in control, then just cross. Keep that one. Again, add from the other group. If not in control, this step three, the add another group, the diuretic. The another one is diuretic. Diuretic. So add if 
it's not in control this is what is called resistant hypertension but in that case you have to reach the full doses of arb ccv and diuretic then you can say this is resistant hypertension and beta blocker at last if no one can control with all these three then add beta blocker due to some reasons due to some evidences beta blocker has been uh, lagging behind among the choices of antihypertensive drugs i'm not going into the details of those scenarios and the things next one please again this is a choice um uh, algorithm next one please so <clears throat> during choice of antihypertensive drug there are some compelling indications of giving drugs and compelling contraindications these compelling indication and contraindication are used to be a terms in the uh, jnc7 guideline but these are the standard teachings beta blockers whenever there is heart failure and myocardial infarction you have to start with beta blocker but in the algorithm it is keep, keep kept in behind it is in fourth says but once the patient has got heart failure beta blocker comes first on the other hand the heart block thake no 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 the previous one the previous one asthma thake beta blocker is contraindicated diuretics heart failure systolic blood pressure must give diuretic gout dyslipidemia these are the theoretical contraindications of diuretics AC inhibitors, heart failure, diabetic nephropathy, severe renal failure. This is a tricky term, severe renal failure. How much severe? The end stage renal failure, if the patient has got auto, creatinine more than three, don't use ACI or ARB. But nowadays, more and more evidences are coming that it can be used in more advanced cases of renal failure. So I'm not going into those debates. The other next uh, Next one, follow-up and monitoring. The very important patient should return to follow-up and adjustment of medications until BP is reduced or to the target. More frequent visit for stage two hypertension or with compelling comorbid conditions, complicating comorbid conditions. visit to frequent it depends on the choice of the physician. Ekhane kuno ekdom mane visit hard and fast kuno kotha nei. Serum potassium and creatinine level monitor korte hobe. Ita avosho yearly ek di bar kore korle hoy. Next one please. After BP is at goal and stable, the follow-up visit will be at three to six months interval. If the blood pressure is stable and at goal, then you have liberty to, to be, uh, give follow-up between three to six months. But if the patient has got comorbidities, like other conditions, then in those situations, more frequent visits might be needed. Eta blood pressure regional lacta pare, tar on no condition control a thaklo ki thaklona shita you uh, have, have to judge on those scenarios. Next one, please. So, improving hypertension, the main thing is that adherence to the regimens. You know, if the patient so blood pressure treatment is a lifelong treatment. You have to have counsel the patient very adequately that you have to continue this treatment for life. So you have to think of about the social status of the patient, the, the financial condition of the patient. If the patient has got a very poor class people and you are prescribing the high Power the SEI or ARB 
then it's not reasonable. It will not be prudent to prescribe those drugs in, the, in this patient. So you have to prescribe in those situations with very cheap drug like diuretic. And in some situation, you have got those lab liberty to prescribe beta blocker, though the, the uh, position of the beta blocker has been put forward in the bottom of the list of the algorithm. But you have to uh, have that uh, judgment to give those drugs very early because it is very important to continue the therapy for life. Next, next slide, please. So, how we can improve the treatment uh, uh, adherence? So, as I have told, all these things are the treatment adherence part counseling of the patient to understand what hypertension is and what can happen if it remains untreated. Ne next one, please. So I'm almost at the near end, dear SARS, Chairman Sir. Uh, from the very beginning, it, uh, it has been shown that, it has been evident that the guidelines are said to be evidence-based all the guidelines are evidence-based, but there are different recommendations by the different expert groups. This is very, very, uh, the evidences are the same because the American experts or the uh, uh, European experts, they, they, they judge the same evidences, but their recommendations are a bit different. So, we have to kept in we have to be very prudent in choosing those those guidelines but we have to follow anyone 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 you can follow treatment must be individualized there is nothing called cookbook recommendation for the treatment of hypertension japni rannar boi ta open kore ranna kore jacchen dekha gelo je paish ranna korte giye pata ta fan e ultaye dilo apni pore pura dite bolche holo so this is this must be individualized two or more antihypertensive medications will be required to achieve the cold blood pressure less than less than less than 14090 again bolchi less than 14590 is a moderate recommendation but for tight recommendation, it is less than 120 by 80. Uh, next one, please, sir. Uh, positive experiences, trust in clinician, and empathic, uh, empathic attitude towards the patient will motivate our patient satisfaction. And these are the key in the compliance of the treatment of the patient. And the responsible physician judgment remains the paramount in controlling the blood pressure, in controlling the, the, the uh, cardiovascular and renovascular morbidity and mortality among the population. So, Mr. Chairman and expert panelist, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I have taken much time from you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, sir, okay. for your amazing and excellent presentation. Now it's time for the question and answer session. I can see the whole comment section flooded with questions, but we'll be able to answer a few of them as the time is short. To start the session, let me request Muhammad Mahfuzul Haq, sir. Uh, thank you, friends. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Mozibur Rahman sir, for an uh, excellent and elaborate presentation of hyper management of hypertension. Actually, hypertension is a big topic, but uh, uh, sir prob uh, probably has touched all uh, the corner of the management of hypertension. So, during the management of hypertension, uh, there are several important things uh, during the evaluation, particularly the uh, cardiovascular risk factor and the hypertension mediated organ damage and we should not uh, forget about the uh, present uh, symptoms which uh, which guides us to the identify the secondary causes of the hypertension so now uh, i'm going to uh, dr professor um, 
you have to be sure to uh, have some comments regarding the uh, management of the hypertension Mahfuz sir, we are in the question and answer session right now. So uh, after finishing the after finishing the question and answer session, then we will yes. Okay. Yes. Many people, many people. So uh, Muhammad Shakat Hoshan has uh, asked a question. Many people have blood pressure 100 over 60 millimeter in our country without symptom when they present with blood pressure 138 over 89 is it hypertension so uh, may i ask the question to the professor muzibur rahman sir uh, thank you very much uh, the question setter dr mohammad sakhat hussein uh, this level you see uh, we need to have the age of the patient uh, 138 systolic is normal 89 is 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 raised uh it is just marginally raised and this by definition by our definition it is not hypertension if we stick to the cutoff value below 130 oh, sorry 140 mm -hmm. by 1 uh, uh, 90 amra jodi eta dhori tahole this is not hypertension but uh, you see the later classification it is less than it is it is more than that then it is hypertensive and you have to treat but in this scenario the treatment may be only the 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 lifestyle modifications and the lifestyle changes so it depends on which classification you uh, guideline are you using that is very important so in uh, in our understanding in our guideline we have one guideline in our country but it, that is not included in in hypertension definition so one thing i want to mention that in my lecture i did not cover the emergency management of hypertension actually management of hypertension and emergency management or crisis the the emergencies those are the different scenarios and uh, that needs another class so i just omitted those part of management of hypertension thank you so next next question is uh, uh, is it necessary to uh, is it, uh, it is necessary to treatment to pre hypertension if lifestyle modification fails to control what is the treatment of isolated diastolic hypertension so i am going to again to professor muzib rahman sir yes thank you uh, pre hypertension if you use the term pre hypertension <clears throat> then it means that the patient will develop hypertension subsequently uh, but you have the treatment can prevent hypertension so you have to treat what is that treatment? Is it, it may be only lifestyle modification. You change lifestyle and after being uh, a lifestyle changes, three to six months, you follow the patient if, uh, and assess the patient time and again, if the patient has got other cardiovascular risk factors and target organ damage, then you have to have uh, uh, to add the drugs in treating those patients. So it depends on the presence of any other cardiovascular risk factors and then depends on the presence of any target organ disease in that patient. So next question is, what is the difference between the hypertensive encephalopathy and malignant hypertension? Sir, is clearly the very high blood pressure, very high blood pressure. The stage zero by re, stage one by grade one, grade two, three by re, very high blood pressure. So, how many symptoms produce kore? So nowadays, these terminologies are not used, especially the malignant hypertension, because hypertension 
ম্যালিগনেন্ট বলা হতো আগে একটা ডেফিনেশন ছিল আমরা সবাই জানি ভেরি হাই ব্লাড প্রেসার ব্লাড প্রেসার মোর দ্যান ওয়ান হান্ড্রেড এইটি বাই মোর মোর দ্যান ওয়ান টোয়েন্টি অ্যান্ড যদি কারো স্টেজ ফোর রেটিনোপ্যাথি থাকে যার যদি কিডনিতে অ্যালবোমিন ইউরিয়া থাকে বা হিমাচ ইউরিয়া থাকে অ্যান্ড ক্রিয়েটমিন যদি রেজড হয় তাদেরকে বলা হয় ম্যালিগনেন্ট হোয়াই ম্যালিগনেন্ট this is hypertension so if they remain untreated then within year most of the patient will be dying and that is why they use this term as malignant hypertension but nowadays the authority in hypertension they usually do not use this terminology and the hypertensive encephalopathy very high blood pressure and suddenly there occurs some brain functional changes convulsion and some uh, deterioration of the level of consciousness is encephalopathy so if you control the blood pressure then if the blood pressure will be so this is the difference between the encephalopathy and malignant hypertension thank you choice of drug changes times many patients taking amlodipine and atenolam combination with good continental compliance what's the opinion so that that question has been provided our most respected person nazul hasan sir so actually uh, i want to go to the motivation ei prashno uttar da hatha sir amar hat pa kapte se sir thank you sir uh, you see once a patient has got a good control with amlodipine and atenolol so my opinion is to control to continue that combination well the main target is to control the blood pressure that control will be beneficial whether this atenolol is beneficial or not is controversial or subjected to some of the evidences some evidence says that atenolol that is beta blocker has got no benefit over the primary prevention of stroke on the other hand amlodipine has got tremendous benefit on the prevention of uh, primary prevention of stroke so as amlodipine is getting that patient so it is better to continue both of these drugs this is my opinion I, in this scenario i will not going back to those of the uh, evidences those are not favoring beta blocker as a choice of drug i am not going into those evidences but uh, because in some situation there are some beneficial effect also you i think you will be agreeing with me that amlodipine is a beta blocker it will be giving rise to a tachycardia palpitation and combination of this atenolol at least would give some of the beneficial uh, effect over those palpitation so i must say that it will be it should be continued thank you sir So up to which level the white coat hypertension may rise? Is there any cutoff value, sir? Ah, uh, our evidence is that way. Mane holo, shab kisi evidence se upar bhitti kore answer kurta hai. You see, a young individual has come to you with some stressful situation, and asar shonge shonge apni blood pressure ta may be nilen. দেখলেন যে ব্লাড প্রেসারটা একটু বেশি তার ট্যাকিকার্ডি আছে সো লেভেল ইজ নট দ্য ইম্পর্টেন্ট বাট ইউজুয়ালি ইউজুয়ালি বলা হয় সিস্টোলিক ব্লাড প্রেসার অ্যারাউন্ড ওয়ান সিক্সটি অ্যান্ড ডায়োস্টলিক ব্লাড প্রেসার অ্যারাউন্ড ওয়ান হান্ড্রেড এরকম লেভেলে যদি থাকে ইয়াঙ্গার ইন্ডিভিজুয়াল যদি হয় এবং তাদের মধ্যে যদি আমি কোনো কোনো কার্ডিভাসকুলার রিস্ক ফ্যাক্টরস না পাই और कार्डियोस्कुलर को टारगेट ऑर्गन डैमेज एर एविडेंस ना पाए তাহলে আমরা ধরে নিতে পারি দিস ইজ বাট অ্যাবসলিউটলি देयर इज नो कट ऑफ वैल्यू ऑन व्हिच वी कैन से दिस इज व्हाइट कोट इफेक्ट so this question uh, already actually answered by our professor mozibur rahman sir during the presentation uh, that is the uh, uh, target level of the uh, or the uh, the cut off value or the definition of the hypertension that has been already discussed in the uh, 
presentation going in with the first follow up after commencing the anti hypertensive so i am going to professor mozibur ham sir again there is no cut off time kono ekebare hard and fast cut off la timeline nai de amar ei shomoy shuru korte it depends on the patient's condition and the level of rise of blood pressure if a patient has come to you with raised blood pressure and raised is very raised is 200 by 110 and you are prescribing a antihypertensive drug as he has got the uh, uh, lvh and also some other complications like diabetes mellitus so he needs frequent visit he needs a visit within 10 to 15 days on the other hand a patient younger patient has come to you with a high blood pressure like 160 over 100 then in this scenario uh, the 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 first visit is not very frequent you can follow the patient after one month but after controlling the blood pressure to target level and being stabilized arthat arekta subsequent visit arekta subsequent visit dekha gelo is stabilized then every 3 to 6 months thank you many patient come to us with diabetic nephropathy but bp below the normal range in this case what should we do so this uh, in the, in this point the the compelling uh, compelling indication of Uh, AC inhibitor or ARB uh, comes. Uh, actually, uh, this question also had been uh, answered by our professor uh, Mozibur Rahman sir. And uh, you know, during this period, we also uh, keep uh, eye on the rising of the creatinine and the uh, uh, changes in the potassium level. Next question: uh, the, uh, Does we prescribe beta blocker in young patient with keeping mind about the side effect of erectile dysfunction? so uh, beta blocker is rarely used or uh, it has been uh, put down in the list of the choice of the anti hypertensive so definitely uh, we should not uh, be we should not uh, choose it at first particularly in this uh, clinical setting uh na thik ache etar answer korar dorkar nai uh in pregnancy is there any recommendation uh, for single uh, high dose drug than the combination so professor mozi brahm sir uh, in pregnancy this is again a different subject in pregnancy we used to use the drugs other than arb or aci either aci or arb ei dui ta ke amader ekdom side e rakhte hobe we, we should not use these two drugs but any other drugs can be used so in those situation you just start with some of the calcium channel blocker beta blockers these are the choice of drug and once upon a time we used to alpha methyl dopa that was a choice of drug but nowadays these drugs are not very much used in uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy so you can use a one drug if it is controlled then go up if any side effects occurs you add another drug this should be the policy this this should be the uh, policy we ekta question chilo jeti chilo holo diabetic patient normal blood pressure acei ache nephropathy ache tar kintu acei add korte hobe arb add korte hobe either of the drug in very low dose add korte hobe ei kotha ra mone rakhte hobe because lower dose those drugs may not produce any anti hypertensive effect eta mathay rekhe you have to prescribe ei ei koyekta age question er kom ekta chilo thank you sir this will, this this will be our last question sir acha thank you okay cm creatinine electrolyte level at baseline and after starting ac inhibitor in elderly patient if yes then what is the recommended for follow up schedule so uh, yes the the answer is yes uh because not in even elderly patients 
in every patients ideally we should we should see the serum potassium level before starting aci or arb ideally it should because very recently i found one patient young patient doctor and he was hypertensive he was getting one of the aci for longer period of time uh, suddenly he got hyperkalemia like 7.8 7.9 calcium uh, sorry potassium level but unfortunately his kidney function was normal is very uh, is not unfortunate is fortunately his kidney function was normal only this uh, aci uh, was responsible for increasing this that is why the recommendation is once you start a, once or twice a year once or twice a year depending on the scenario of your patient you should follow the patient up in regard to potassium level thank you very much thank you sir uh, for uh, giving the answer all the question uh, which was uh, asked by our uh, trainee and the audience so as we are discussing about the hypertension management one of the issue is the uh, measuring the uh, risk factors and we have to quantify the risk factor objectively and uh, and we also the uh, stratification should be in uh, uh, objectively measured and uh, there are several uh, tools uh, regarding that starting from the framing heart uh, uh, the heart uh, the study uh, so there are uh, several uh, tools uh, still uh, uh, is uh, used in the different country in different contexts. Uh, uh, the bottom line is we have to quantify the risk factors. And so uh, I'm going to Dr. Professor uh, Major Ritat, uh, Mohammed Zindul uh, to have some comment regarding the management of the hypertension. Thank you very much. <clears throat> First of all, I want to give my thanks and congratulations to the, the speaker, Professor Dr. Mujibur Rahman, for his nice, deliberate, informative, and uh, fruitful discussion regarding the management of hypertension. It's a very big subject. Uh, in, a, in this short time, it is very difficult to cover up uh, all the corners of the subject, but even then uh, he uh, tried to manage uh, the things in a very nice way. Uh, today's session is their person, uh, Professor Khan Abul Kalam Azad, uh, Governor SCP, uh, Bangladesh Chapter uh, Elective, and uh, former uh, President of uh, Bangladesh Society of Medicine. Then uh, my uh, co-panelist, uh, Professor Dr. Enamul Kurim, Professor and Principal of Universal Medical College, and host, moderator, and my uh, dear viewers, the examinees. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I just uh, add uh, something, just discussion uh, uh, is not there uh, too much. I must uh, uh, congratulate and thank to the uh, SCP and also the Bangladesh Society of Medicine to organize these sorts of uh, uh, sessions for the uh, sake of the day-to-day uh, uh, -day time, uh, up-to-date of the uh, exam systems. So they must be uh, thank, uh, uh, thanked. And uh, regarding the management of hypertension, there are so many things. I want to just uh, point out, we are running short of time. Uh, one thing, the measurement of blood pressure. So regarding the measurement of blood pressure, uh, it is very important because uh, uh, the patients are coming with their assistance and the patient, uh, especially during the diagnosis, the, the leveling of the hypertension and also the changing of the drugs and also the uh, the uh, comparison with the uh, symptoms with other uh, comorbidities so in these situations i think 
the blood pressure measurement is very very important in, in that regard uh, i uh, just uh, 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 written one uh, uh, dissertation during my uh, part two fcvc examination in 19 uh, uh, 92 uh, 1992 uh, in bangladesh uh, armed forces medical journal bfm journal uh, the measurement of blood pressure and uh, in that uh, in that one just in the uh, undergraduate medicine and postgraduate medicine uh, sometimes uh, in postgraduate medicine especially i uh, want to uh, examine to uh, show the blood pressure you just measure the blood pressure because the blood pressure measurement uh, is very important in that sense the, it is the confidence uh, uh, of the patient and also the accuracy uh, because the uh, uh, it uh, uh, if uh, uh, one patient is uh, diagnosed at level of blood pressure, he, needs, he or she needs to take it uh, lifelong. And there are so many uh, uh, diversities of medicine, medical uh, medicine drug uh, uh, implication also. And regarding the resistance blood pressure, um, uh, just I, uh, uh, it was um, uh, discussed. I want to mention one thing. There are the three things uh, for the examinees. The resistant blood pressure for uh, the reason is three. One is non-compliance, and two is the uh, uh, underdose or uh, drug replacement, and the third one is the second uh, to uh, establish the secondary hypertension. So, the, during the uh, non-compliance, the empathy, the Professor Mujibaraman told uh, uh, repeatedly, the empathy is very very important. I am to just a panelist, I am just to doctor, because doctors are crazy in their whole life. Patient ashe, attendant thake, tade blood pressure, amra major kuri. Amra ni jera ekto shomoy niye, ba ekto dekhe jate jinsite ke amra bhalo bhabe major korte pari. Amra attendance, assistant diye major mein na kore, amra just Eighteen type of barrier keep. We have a diagnosis or no modification of the drugs and the comorbidity is diagnosis or no. Jehan Amade very much important. The Nukula Made Polly Mumana Palaway. Arrector Dinish, the white coat hypertension to Kothata make two modification go to Chai. It is the white coat effect in hypertension. It is the effect of white coat, a white coat effect in hypertension. That is the which comes through the sympathetic nervous system. We know that sympathetic nervous system activity increases the blood pressure. So, white coat effect. If we measure, we allow the patient, uh, measure, uh, allow the patient to be measured blood pressure uh, by the assistant or in the home, uh, not by myself. So, uh, question of white coat effect is less. And another one is, uh, one question was asked by the examinees. Uh, if uh, uh, what is the range of the white coat uh, uh, hypertension? Actually, the, the white coat hypertension uh, uh, it is uh, nowhere uh, uh, probably written uh, in our practice. I know uh, I know what I believe. Uh, it should be not less than uh, not uh, 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 less than uh, ten. Uh, if it is uh, uh, more than ten. It should not be that we, we should cut off value the 10 millimeter of mercury. In diastolic hypertension, uh, Professor Mojuburaman told uh, SGM Chudhi and other professors we, we in our time uh, actually really it was fact the diastolic hypertension. But some patients are coming, we are discussing about the hypertension. There are so many patients are coming with the uh, low blood pressure, but the actors have our pressure on a core, our pressure on a core. In that case, measurement of blood pressure, the Porotko sound and the uh, type 4 and type 5 sounds, the muffling sound and the last one sounds. In some uh, secondary hypertension, the diastolic pressure, in if we take the type uh, uh, 4 stage of measurement sound, it should be zero. So in that case, we should take the uh, type 4 uh, stage. So in, uh, uh, as a whole, uh, we should uh, be careful about this. Otherwise, the uh, session was very much, uh, very much fruitful. 
very much fruitful informative and uh, i also got benefited uh, uh, also and viewers should also be benefited so uh, thank you very much thank you all uh, thank you professor uh, uh, dr mohammad zulha sodde sir uh, particularly uh, sir has given uh, give the uh, has given the emphasis on the measurement of blood pressure and the elimination of the white coat effect so uh, not only to eliminate the white coat effect uh, of measuring the hypertension but also to obtain the representative blood pressure of a patient we should encourage the patient to measure the out of bp uh, out of office blood pressure uh, monitoring so nowadays out of uh, office bp monitoring that is home blood pressure monitoring and ambulatory bp monitoring has given the emphasis because the a patient when comes to me this is a just a snapshot of the blood pressure but what is the blood pressure his patient is having in his house during activities so that can be that the representative blood pressure only can be obtained in the home bp monitoring and the ambulatory bp monitoring that's why the home bp monitoring giving uh, has been given uh, emphasis nowadays so uh, now uh, may I, uh, request our professor enamel korim sir to uh, have some comments regarding the management of the hypertension sir ek to unmute korte hobe enamel korim ha thank you sir ekhon shona jacche ha sir shona jacche I first of all thank and congratulate Professor Mujibur Rahman for his excellent and elaborate presentation on the management of hypertension. At the same time, I thank Professor Khan Abul Kalam Azad for chairing this session. Management of hypertension is a very elaborate and sometimes easy, sometimes very difficult. First of all, the difficulty arises when we record blood pressure. Frequently, patients come with blood pressure recording from medicine shop. In our country, the many of the medicine shop people, they measure the blood pressure. And most of the time, their recording is wrong. So, blood pressure recording should be done by an experienced person, particularly a medical graduate, not a shopkeeper. This is very important. And again, in the management of blood pressure, it is not only the blood pressure that is targeted, but also the comorbid conditions and target organ damage. These are very important. Comorbid conditions like diabetes, dyslipidemia, smoking, and others. So these are very important in the management of hypertension. And uh, it is very important to stage, stage the level of blood pressure because according to stage, the drugs will change. This is very important. And again, when we prescribe a patient, we have to give some advice like lifestyle modification, particularly physical activities and dietary habits are very important. And also smoking should be stopped completely and patients should not take any extra salt and they, they have to take regular physical activity, physical exercise, at least 30 to 40 minutes daily, five days in a week. So these are very important in the management of hypertension. And again, I thank and congratulate Professor Mozibur Rahman for his excellent and elaborate presentation. I also thank Professor Khan Abul Kalam Azad Dr. Mahfuz, Mahfuzul Haq, Dr. Prince, for their excellent job in this session. Thank you all.
thank you, sir. Uh, sir has given the emphasis on the particularly uh, non pharmacological management of the hypertension, lifestyle modification, and, uh, and that's really important that uh, lifestyle modification. And we also, Sir also has given in emphasis in the comorbidities, which is not only important uh, uh, in the cardiovascular stratification, it is also important sometimes comorbidity uh, uh, guides us uh, guides us to a choice uh, antihypertensive, that, that is the compelling indication. And sometimes we have to also see the uh, any symptoms. Though the uh, secondary hypertension is rare, sometimes we have to look for that. So uh, 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 and this session actually was very excellent. And uh, I think the many of the things we can learn during this session uh, from uh, both our um, uh, expert and the presenter. So uh, at this level, I want to thank uh, all of the um, uh, speaker and expert. Uh, now, may I request our Professor Khan Abul Kalam as a sir uh, to uh, the, have the uh, uh, comment and uh, to uh, conclude the session. Thank you, Dr. Mahfuz. Uh, again, it was a great show. You know that uh, a teacher uh, making a lecture which is comprehensive, evidence-based, but very easy, palatable. Professor Mujibur Rahman made such a lecture. Uh, there are several things. One is that our, uh, uh, first of all, SAP, uh, SAP organizing so many lectures on different issues. And definitely today's was uh, a real, uh, very good lecture, which is very important for a doctor uh, to follow throughout his career, not only for the exam, but uh, throughout his career to practice in real life situation. And also we found two great teachers, Professor Muhammad Adamul Karim and Professor Muhammad Julhasuddin, uh, very soft spoken two personalities a very, uh, you know, empathetic personalities. Uh, they were with us in the show and they talk, uh, they, they talk on uh, different issues and they have got huge experience uh, throughout their life, treating thousands of patients with hypertension, with different types of drugs. We began our career with your C diuretic and then beta blocker and then gradually we prescribe so many drugs and then one after another uh, uh, discovery of newer drugs came into the pipeline and so we are seeing uh, that uh, some of uh, very good drugs are there to prescribe so this is one and i uh, like to say that Mahfuz, the way he was talking and also he added so many important points uh, with the, with different issues. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahfuz, for your presentation. And also, I want to say that uh, our teacher, uh, because you know, whenever we remember our teachers, especially at GM to this, still I remember in Gallery One of DMC, we are learning hypertension, we are learning all cardiovascular, angina pectoris, ischemic heart disease, bulbular heart disease. At the time, rheumatic fever was also a very good topic infective endocarditis, heart failure, all what taught by Professor Jim Chodri. And so still we remember in fifth year classes. So it was so wonderful. And also another important uh, point I want to mention, uh, when Professor Mujib was showing different guidelines, in 2004, uh, Professor Mujib, uh, Professor Emajol Chodri and me, we were joined with Another great teacher, Professor Ekem Rafiquddin sir, he was very interested in treating hypertension and regarding the cardiovascular, he had a very good training in cardiovascular treatment in the then IPGMR. So we used to see that sir was very happy uh, with the cardiovascular disorders at the time. And uh, 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 during 2004, we, we went to Paris 
in in a meeting uh, with European Society of Hypertension, we represented Bangladesh, and it was such a wonderful experience at the time, you know, because you know at the time we didn't have enough information regarding uh, treatment of hypertension other than your GNC report. So that was also a very good experience, and I also uh, pray for the salvation of the great soul of Prophet Second Rafiqudin whenever we learn hypertension. I just will give two emphasis. One is that when you find a patient with hypertension, the blood pressure, either the patient says, because you know nowadays, most of the people, when they come out from their house, they just go to the, uh, to the, to the pharmacy, which is located in their mohalla, and a person is measuring the blood pressure. So, measurement of blood pressure is very important. What Professor Mujib emphasized. So, when you find a patient com complaining of hypertension, with or incidentally you diagnose the patient is having hypertension, or it was diagnosed during screen pr screening procedure, and he has come with that. So, give uh, emphasis. You take the history number one in details. And you just give emphasis on five points. Number one, you establish the presence of hypertension with accurate measurement of blood pressure. And at least three measurements are necessary. Not only one measurement. Two measurements on sitting or lying position and one on standing position. And you check for the partial drop. Number two, you see the risk factors. All your demographic profile, uh, cardiovascular risk factor with your dyslipidemia, obesity, waist circumference, any any features of your uh, uh, your uh, dyslipidemia present in the patient. So all these things have to be noted. This is the second one. The third one, you have to examine the patient thoroughly, starting from the head, uh, looking at the fundus, then you go through the chest and the abdomen. You look for everything, all possible findings. A hypertensive patient can have either primary or secondary. You examine very thoroughly. This is the number three. Number four, then you make a plan to think of your any target organ damage. So again, you re-examine the patient for the evidence of your target organ damage. This target organ damage will be planned by physical examination and doing some laboratory tests. So plan for some laboratory tests if you suspect some target organ damage. And number five, that is very important. You have to plan for a treatment protocol in this particular individual patient for managing hypertension. So you check for comorbidities because presence or absence of a particular comorbidity will give a guidance to choose a particular antihypertensive. So that is very important. So comorbidities may modify the form of treatment as Prof. Mujib showed in the slide that some of the disadvantages or contraindication to a particular type of drug. So you have to find it out for choosing an antihypertensive. This is number one, the five point uh, 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 examination of a patient with hypertension. And you know, some important investigation what would to be done. You know, Professor GM Chaudhary sir used to say, you go for a CBC, you go for a urine examination, you go for a serum creatinine, you go for an ECG and a chest X-ray. These are the basic investigation. But nowadays, we add something more. We go for TSH, blood sugar. We go for creatinine. We go for ultrasonography of abdomen. We go for uh, echocardiography. And we go for your serum electrolytes. So if you combine all these in a simple investigations for a patient, you can find uh, a way to exclude many of the secondary conditions to produce hypertension. In our time, you used to say you start giving the treatment for primary hypertension. If you find it is refractory or resistant hypertension, then you think of secondary. No. From the very beginning, you have to exclude if possible secondary. So Professor Mujib emphasized it because, you know, on many occasions, uh, it may not be uh, suspected. So suspect from the very beginning, yes. I'll be treating this person as one of the 95% of the community, but we have to find out whether he is one of the 5% in the community. So with these few words,
again i like to say that it was such an excellent session i i i i i i, I can say that all those important you know uh you know the, uh, the trials and others to find out the best possible solution so i like to congratulate professor mujib for his excellent deliberation and also you saw that professor mujib showed his own paper on hypertension so again i like to congratulate for making us pride uh, uh, in the world so with this few words uh, you know two hours have passed since we began our journey in the evening and uh, so i like to say with this few words again thank you my dear uh, participants the most important part was that i was reading the questions made by the student it means they are further advanced the types of questions which appeared in the screen it means they study they have got a very good sense very good knowledge on different aspects of hypertension and so the you see your questions were so beautiful i learned so many things from your questions also and also again thanks to professor mujib because they were wonderfully answered so no more talk so with this few words i like to hand over the microphone to dr mahfuz and to dr prince thank you very much assalamu alaikum good night Sadly, everybody we have come to the end of today's program as well as the session we have learned so many important things from sun today many many thanks to the speaker the chair the expert panel and last but not the least the moderator sir for managing time for this program from their very busy schedule i would like to thank all the audience who were with us throughout the event especially those who asked very interesting questions hope you got your answer if you joined late or couldn't see the whole program there is no need to be worried you will find the whole program as well as all the previous on on our youtube channel right after the live session finishes today was the last program so see you all on some other programs until then take care and good night